Hi everybody. So we're going to continue uh, our discussion of direct proofs from chapter 4 and I think this is the first section where we're actually going to get into the mechanics of proofs. And my strategy here is I'm going to start by working through something very much in the style of the way the book does it. So um, you should certainly read this section of the book very carefully because there's a lot of great examples there. And then I'm going to try to fill in what I think of as some of the um, some of the unspoken pitfalls that are uh, that are kind of omitted from the book's discussion. So let's start though by looking at an example of a very simple proof of a very simple proposition similar to those that are done uh, in the book. So a direct proof is based on trying to prove a proposition or a theorem. Remember proposition is really just another word for theorem, maybe not the biggest theorem, the small theorem. And they have the form, if some property P is true, then some property Q is true. And the goal is to establish the truth of this implication. Now, the, we often think that what we're trying to show is that Q is true, but remember that it's actually the whole implication that we're trying to, to prove true. So there's two kind of possibilities. One is that P, the, the uh, the part of the statement in the if, the hypothesis, could be false. And we know that an implication is automatically true if the hypothesis is false. So there's nothing to be done in that case. If the hypothesis is true, however, then the implication is only true if the conclusion is true. So uh, when trying to deal with, prove the truth of a statement of the form if P then Q, as a practical matter, we just assume P is true and try to conclude Q. So proofs of this form look very standard. They have the pr proposition, if you strip away all of the, uh, all of the uh, complicated stuff, and we write proof, and then we say, suppose P is true, and then we write a bunch of stuff, and at the end, we uh, are able to conclude Q. And what are these things that go in the box? Well, actually, they're a sequence of many implications. I mean, one th way to think about the way a direct proof works is we have P and we have Q. And now P is, we, we, is, we show that P implies some new statement, P1, and that in turn implies some statement, P2, and that in turn implies some statement, P3. And we do this for quite a while. Maybe we have N statements and eventually we can conclude Q. And the point is supposed to be that each of these steps have a clear justification in terms of definitions or in terms of axioms. So, for example, they could be algebraic steps, but if they're algebraic steps, those are um, some of the things that we're taking for granted. Those are some of the axioms that we're relying on. So, uh, what a proof is really doing is it's taking a big implication step which is not at all obvious, and finding a bunch of small steps, each of which is clearly true because it's close to an axiom or relies on something which is, which is very clear. And then you see if P is true, then, Q, then P1 is true, and if P1 is true, then P2 is true. If, all, if we've established the truth of all of those implications, then we have established the truth of the entire implication. That's the goal. So here's a really simple example. And as I said, the book does some other very simple examples. Suppose we wanted to prove that the sum of two odd numbers is an even number. Well, the book sort of suggests that you think about it in the following way. You, um, you have P, which is, I mean, this doesn't look like an if then statement, but it, it really is. What it says is, for all integers a and b, such that a and b are odd, then a plus b is even. Or maybe even to make it look more like an if-then statement, we could say if 
a and b are odd integers, then a plus b is even. So one of the first things that you have to do is to decode the proposition and identify what is the hypothesis and what is the conclusion. It's important not to get those things messed up. So in this case, the hypothesis is that a and b are odd integers, and the conclusion is that a plus b is even. So this is our p, and this is our q. And the book suggests that we write these things down with some space in between them, so I've done that. I've written the hypothesis, suppose a and b are odd integers, that's here. And then I left a bunch of space, and then I wrote the conclusion, therefore a plus b is even, and the goal is somehow to fill in the blank space. Well, here's, I'll work through this and we'll, uh, we'll see in kind of a, oh, hi, what, how this might go. So the first thing we would say is, look, a and b are odd integers. Well, this is a technical term, odd. It has a definition. The definition of an odd integer, there are several, but the one that we can rely on here is that a is odd if there is a k, an integer k, so that a equals 2k plus 1. Now, so therefore, I apply that definition. So a is an odd integer, and so therefore, there is an integer k, so that a equals 2k plus 1. Now, if you apply the definition naively, you might also say that, there's, that b is an odd integer, so b equals 2k plus 1. But you would immediately be in trouble, because um, you would end up making a equal to b if I, if I use the same letter k here. So you have to be careful. This, the k in the definition just means some arbitrary integer. And if you have two arbitrary integers in a proof which are unrelated, you have to use different letters for them, because otherwise you're going to create the implicit assumption that they're actually equal to one another, and you don't want to do that. So that's why we have to have, we apply the definition and we write a is a 2k plus 1, and we write b is 2u plus 1, because u is another, a different integer, at least potentially a different integer. And we still have this gap that we're trying to fill in. Well, we can now compute a plus b and do some algebra. So a plus b is 2k plus 1 plus 2u plus 1. And now we can regroup. That's 2 times k plus u plus 2, or 2 times k plus u plus 1. This isn't supposed to be particularly deep mathematics. So what have we done here? We've shown that a plus b, which is the sum, is 2 times an integer. And an even integer is a number, an integer, which is 2 times another integer. So we make that explicit. The definition of even integer says that an integer x is even if there is an integer y, so that x equals 2y. We found that a plus b equals 2 times k plus u plus 1, where k plus u plus 1 is an integer. And now, finally, this step is clear because we've applied the definition. a plus b is even. So we have um, managed in this process to, um, to prove this proposition. And we relied on the definitions. I didn't write them down, but we relied on the definitions of even and odd numbers, a is odd if there exists k in z so that a equals 2k plus 1. And the definition a is even if there exists k in z so that a equals 2k. OK, so that's the book's approach. And they give some more examples. And I'm going to look at some more examples in a little while. But I wanted to kind of stop and maybe make a little bit of a philosophical commentary here. Because there's a, something which is missing from this whole discussion, a lot of things that are missing. But there's one big thing which is missing is that um, 
it isn't this. I mean, this makes it seem like constructing a proof is a mechanical process. And that is really not true, because at the beginning of this whole process, I mean, before you really even are able to write something down, you have to understand what's happening. And you, you so it's not like you can just sit down with the definitions and grind out a machine and produce a proof. And it, I mean, this is why I think this kind of mathematics is so different, for example, from calculus, where in, a lot of times you can just you know, turn the cranks. Not always. It can become much more complicated than that. But but a lot of the way we teach math is is as a crank turning exercise. Even in this very simple problem, um, you still have to think about how are you going to get from this odd a and b odd all the way over to a plus b even. You need a strategy. And sometimes. Uh, you know, it's not clear where that strategy is going to come from. So there's what's missing, I think, from the discussion of the book is the part of mathematics which happens before you sit down to write a proof, which is where you first figure out what's going on. So, I mean, very naively in this situation, if you were back in elementary school, you might do some experiments. You might say, well, let's see, 3 and 7 are odd, and 3 plus 7 is 10, and 10 is even. So that's good. That checks out. Or um, Let's try 5 plus uh, 11. 5 plus 11 is 16, and that's even. So that checks out. And maybe you would do a few more, and you would say, hmm, it really does seem like the sum of two odd numbers is even. And then you might think about, your well, what's going on here? And, and um, so you would say, why is it that if I take two things which are one more than a multiple of two, and I add them together, I end up with a multiple of two? You, you could even draw a picture. You could say, so here's an odd number. It looks like this. It's got this part here is a multiple of 2. And this part here is 1. And then I have another thing like this, which is a multiple of 2. And then I have a 1 hanging over the end. And when I rearrange these, you see, so the way I know that it's a multiple of 2 is I can divide it in half, right? So there's these parts. And so if I put this together, maybe I can even use different colors. Let's 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 color this one in yellow, uh, and this one in uh, red. So I've got two yellow ones and two red ones, and then I have these two purple ones left at the end that come from the one and the one. And looking at it this way, you, it, you can see that, well, I can take this, this combination of two odd things and break it up into, into two parts, because I can take one yellow one, one red one, and one purple one, and one yellow one, one red one, and one purple one. And then I have split up my sum into two equal pieces, and so it must be even. And then you could try to convert that into algebra, and see uh, what's going on in algebraic terms. And eventually you would say, ah, I get it. I understand why the sum of two odd numbers is even. Now I need to find a way to write it down. And the proof is what happens at the end when you're going to try to write something down. So um, I guess what I'm trying to emphasize here is you can't prove something that you don't understand. And understanding it is more of an exercise in problem solving than any kind of mechanical process that you can apply. And fundamentally, your goal is to explain why something that you see is true really is true in a convincing way. All right, we'll look at some more examples.